Thank you, Yust, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. So my name is Marco Minghini, and uh, I work as a PhD student at Politecnico di Milano, and I will show you a work developed with uh, Professor Brevelli and Dr. Zamboni, which, uh, uh, as you can guess from the title, deals with the issue of participation within web-based uh, GIS systems. But let's start from the beginning. So the, the context of the study is what we call geospatial web or geoweb. That can be defined as the set of tools, of services, of infrastructure related to the use of geospatial information over the web. But what do we have in this context? First of all, we have data, and you know, this data can come from different sources. We have users accessing data, and again, they can do it from a variety of possible instruments. We have data catalogs, and then we have data processing tools. Of course, the glue between all these elements is represented by the Internet. But as you know, the, uh, the rise of Web 2.0 has dramatically overturned the uh, paradigm of user interaction over the web. And this new model, which uh, we can say is based on collaboration, on sharing, online sharing of contents, has affected so much also the GeoWeb that the term GeoWeb 2.0 was coined. And actually it was coined together with a series of other concepts like NeoGeography. NeoGeography denotes the, the possibility also for non-expert users to build up their own maps using these new web mapping technologies. But for instance, also the concept of uh, volunteer geographic information, which highlights the fact that uh, uh, geospatial information is no longer coming only from the top, as it was in the past, but uh, also more and more from the bottom, so from the single users. And then, uh, thanks to the incredible spread of mobile devices, the concept of PGIS, or participatory GIS, which actually was uh, born in the mid-1990s, so much before Web 2.0, uh, this concept is acquiring more and more importance and is evolving towards some web-based and shared platforms where users can dynamically add and edit contents. But what are the requirements that such systems have to meet? First of all, as they uh, embrace the entire community, they uh, must provide interoperability in terms of both uh, data formats and services. Uh, they also must be able to manage different users with, in principle, different privileges. Uh, and they must also allow these users to act on data for instance, add data, uh, save data, delay data, edit data, and so on, and also to uh, create customized mashups. So this is the uh, architecture, of course, all open source, of this web-based uh, participatory system that we developed. Uh, now I would like to uh, make just a very general overview, and then I will go deeper into each part. But uh, let's start from data collection on the field, which is achieved through this ODK, the Open Data Kit Suite, which is mainly composed of a server-side application called Aggregate, which is installed under, under Tomcat, and is connected to a PostgreSQL database with, of course, a PostGIS uh, spatial extension, and uh, an Android uh, application called ODK Collect, which is useful to feed our database with the user field register contents. These contents are then web published, in this case as WMS by GeoServer, and then they are uh, accessible. They can be accessible, first of all, in two dimensions. We develop different viewers, for instance, for traditional computers using uh, open layers, GeoX, uh, XJS, but also for mobile devices using, for instance, Leaflet, and again, open layers with uh, jQuery Mobile. But we uh, also developed a, a fully participative 3D platform using the NASA Whirlwind Virtual Globe. Okay, let's start from data collection on the field, which, as I said, is uh, accomplished by this open data kit, the ODK suite. Uh, I decided to make this sort of introduction about ODK because I think it is the less known software among all those included in, in the architecture. So, uh, what to say? Uh, ODK is a toolkit, is free and open source, and is it's currently used in hundreds of projects all around the world. Uh, it's composed of three different but complementary modules, which actually correspond to the three steps, if we want, of the data collection on the field. First of all, we have two alternative tools for creating the forms, the formats, the questionnaires that users will then compile on the field. And they are ODK build and XLS form. I will show you in the following. Then we have this uh, Android application called ODK Collect that allows users to fill the form and to send it to the server. 
or actually to the server side component, which is ODK aggregate. It can run in the cloud on a virtual machine or, and this is our case, on uh, a local server backed with a PostgreSQL database. This is ODK build. Uh, it's uh, an HTML5 web application providing a very intuitive user interface, uh, drag and drop user interface, and it supports a lot of fields. For instance, here you can see a date, the choice of one option within a list, a text field, but we can also register a position using, for instance, the GPS of the device, and we can also upload uh, multimedia contents. Here you see image, but also audios and videos are supported. As I said, the alternative tool is called XLS form. It allows uh, to build more complex forms using just a spreadsheet. Anyway, in both cases, uh, at the end of the process, the form is uh, uh, exported as an XML file at the end, and it is uploaded on the server. So once it is on the server, it is managed by ODK aggregate component, and this application allows, uh, plays also the very important role of managing the different users that, have dif that can have different privileges. For instance, users can uh, have the right just to compile forms and send them to the server, or the right to also download forms, or to even create new forms, delete forms, and so on, till the uh, administrator profile, which of course can also create and manage all, all the users. Okay, once the form is on the server, uh, using an Android device, we can download the ODK Collect application and we can start performing our survey. So this is the main page of the application. Of course, the first step is to connect to the server and after the login is to choose the uh, form we are interested in from the list of all the available forms. Uh, here, for instance, we select this form called Point of Interest, which, uh, as we will see later, will uh, allow users to uh, report some touristic and cultural points of interest. And then we can download the form. Then we, uh, we start perform our survey. So we uh, choose to fill a blank form we access the point of interest form and we, we arrive to the real questionnaire which guides the user in the uh, compilation of the different fields. For instance, the date of the survey, the type of point of interest, in this case a historical monumental building, the, let's say, the nature of the subclassification of the point of interest, here a villa, the name of the point of interest, here it's Villa Olmo, for those of you who are familiar with Lake Como, it's a famous villa on, on Lake Como, and uh, then using the GPS, for instance, of the device, we can register the position. We provide also an image of the point of interest by taking a picture in real time or by selecting a picture that is already available in the device archive, and finally we save our form. So after filling the form, which of course does not require uh, internet connection, we can choose if modifying the answers to the questionnaires or if uh, having this time an active internet connection to send the forms to the server. So here I show you again the server side uh, part of the architecture just to, um, to let you understand how the ODK aggregate interacts with the other components. Actually it's very easy because when the forms come from ODK collect which is the Android application to the ODK aggregate server, they automatically fill the uh, synchronized PostgreSQL database and then it's very easy because uh, using PostGIS, GeoServer can read the data and can publish them mm, as WMS, for instance. Uh, as I said, we developed uh, some uh, viewers, different viewers, according to the specifications, the requirements, the needs of the uh, applications we were dealing with. For instance, this is a very simple, very traditional viewer developed with open layers, GeoX and XJS, which simply uh, represents our points of interest on top of a base map. If we click on a point of interest, uh, WMS get feature info request is performed and a pop-up shows the information that the user has originally collected on the field. This is a very similar application uh, that we developed for a project involving some students of a secondary school who uh, mapped the city center of Como, um, who mapped the architectural barriers of the city center of Como. So uh, you should see different symbols, probably it's not so clear, but you should see different symbols for stairs, for ramps, uh, and for pathways. And uh, even if here we see just uh, an image, they also determine for each of them if it was or not conformal to the current uh, directive. This is just an example. 
Another example is this one, uh, which is a client developed with the leaflet JavaScript uh, uh, library in the frame of a project this time that we are starting with the uh, Basin Authority of River Po. River Po is the, the longest river in Italy. Actually, they are starting to make some experiments on this participatory data collection in order to um, report damages or uh, problems or environmental emergencies related to the river. As you can guess, this uh, viewer is particularly suitable for large screen devices, so typically tablets. While uh, this one is uh, specifically thought for, um, for mobile devices and for small screen devices, typically smartphones. Here the flags that you see uh, in the left figure are user reports of road pavement damages, which unfortunately has been a very serious problem in our city during uh, the last winter. And what we did in this case is was just to uh, customize the SLD symbolization in GeoServer so that the flags are green, yellow, or red according to the the entity, the, the, the dangerousness of the of the damage. And as you can see here, uh, when the layer is clicked, the, the results of the query are uh, represented in a separate page, which uh, is much more suitable uh, for these uh, small screen devices. To summarize, in two dimensions we have simply developed viewers, while in three dimensions we uh, developed a real participatory platform named PolyCrowd. So PolyCrowd, first of all, allows uh, the three-dimensional visualization of our touristic points of interest using the uh, NASA World Wind Virtual Globe. But this is not all, because uh, in PolyCrowd, users can also uh, share their additional knowledge about points of interest um, and also the customized projects that they can create uh, on top of the globe. Before entering the PolyCrowd system, I would like to briefly introduce WorldWind, which is the uh, open source virtual globe developed by NASA. Uh, WorldWind is actually available as an SDK and uh, so it's really uh, customizable and improvable and then it's written in Java, so it's multi-platform. Uh, here you have just some of the possible features. Of course, if you want to know more, you can have a look at the website. We can just say that WorldWind provides uh, a pool of uh, predefined of default layers, both um, satellite imagery and digital terrain models, but what really makes it suitable for scientific application is the fact that you can place on the globe uh, actually, w whatever layer you want, and you can also customize the terrain information. For instance, if you have your own uh, very high resolution DTM, and if you need it for some three dimensional analysis, you can use it in WorldWind. Okay, this is the PolyCrowd architecture, again, divided in the server uh, side and the client side. Um, so, the platform, which is available as a Java Web Start application, First of all, access is our, uh, our layer of points of interest from GeoServer and it renders it on, on WorldWind. Uh, then, as I will show you in some minutes, uh, users can, um, can view, can edit on, and can upload contents related to the points of interest using some web pages that are dynamically generated both as JSP pages and uh, servlet objects executed inside Glassfish. What is important is also this MySQL database, uh, which allows to store additional information like uh, all the user profiles and the related privileges, but also the metadata related to the WMS layers that users can use inside the platform and all the projects that are saved within uh, PolyCrowd. Let's go step by step also here. So let's start from data visualization uh, on WorldWind. In this case, we actually created three different uh, layers in GeoServer. In order to represent uh, our points of interest on the globe with three different symbolizations or levels of detail according to the altitude of the point of view over the globe. And in particular for uh, high altitudes, all the points are represented in the same way using place marks. Vice versa for uh, medium altitudes, uh, we use different icons according to the uh, type of point of interest. And at small altitudes, we use other icons according to the nature of the point of interest. These are the same icons that are also available in the uh, Android uh, ODK Collect application. 
But uh, whatever is the altitude of the point of view, if we click on a point of interest, uh, a balloon again appears showing uh, all the uh, field collected information and also the picture. If we look at the um, balloon, we see that the last word can be, can be view or view slash edit according to the type of user. And in fact, one feature of Polycrowd is the possibility of registering to the platform, providing, uh, as usually, a username and a password. And in fact, registered users can also uh, add additional contents about uh, a point of interest, while non-registered users can just see what registered users have uploaded. This is an example of a web page for uh, of a point of interest for non-registered users, while this is the corresponding one for registered users. You see that there is this uh, button which I like, which uh, um, allows registered users to add, for instance, an image, an audio file, a video file, or to enter a comment about a point of interest. Um, registered users can also create and save projects, and uh, when I say save project, I mean save not just the list of all the available layers, but also um, all the contextual information, for instance, the uh, position and the camera orientation of the point of view uh, over the globe. All the uh, saved projects uh, are stored in a catalog. All the users can access this project, but of course, only the owner of a project can then modify it. And something else that uh, only registered users can do is to uh, connect to WMS servers and add layers in order to create customized uh, mashups. Um, also in this case, all the layers that are added remains are stored in a catalog and remain available for the entire community. This is an example in which you see uh, our point of interest uh, superimposed on a historical map and other WMS layers. I would like also to mention that this Polycrowd application was one of the winners of the uh, first World Wind Europe Challenge, which was a competition organized by NASA, and uh, well, which was looking for, uh, let's say, some World Wind based solutions for a uh, European community. I would like just to mention the other members of the team. So we were four students, uh, okay, apart from me, Michele Bianchi, Rodi Jolak, and Andres Quinones, and our mentor was uh, Giorgio Zamboni. So thank again to all of them. Uh, conclusions, so we uh, developed a free and open source architecture uh, allowing users to collect georeference data on the field and to share them on the web. And in three dimensions, as, as, I, as I show you, also uh, really fully, let's say, participative platform with also some uh, other uh, functionalities. Uh, we are thinking to many possible improvements, of course, but uh, I would like just to mention one. That is the, um, um, an, an extension that we want to, to, to do to the ODK Collect uh, Android application because um, there can be a, point, a problem in the GPS positioning from mobile devices, not just the problem related to the uh, low accuracy in the, in the positioning of the device itself, but also the, the problem related to the fact that the position where I perform the survey, which is, of course, my position, typically the position from which I take the picture can, of course, be very different from the position of the point of interest that is being photographed. And for this reason, we are thinking to modify the ODK Collect in order to uh, allow users to manually choose the position or to manually refine the uh, GPS estimated position using an interactive map. Of course, this would also allow positioning without using GPS or for devices without GPS. And then there is another point uh, that is the synchronization of the user profiles on ODK and Polycrowd so that a user can just register once and use both because up to now it's not mm, in this way. Okay, I'm, I finished, so if you have questions, mm, just ask. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. Thank you for a, a crystal clear uh, presentation. You, you led us to the, the requirements, the implementation, the res results, and you were honest about everything here. And but of course, there are still questions, I think. Are there questions? I know it was crystal clear, so. Yeah, I'm curious about the 3D support. Um, any issues with navigation on a 2D device in a 3D world? And well, of course, uh, I forgot to mention, but this 3D navigation was just for computer, I mean, because whirlwind 
I mean, in your wind, they were developing uh, also the Android uh, version, but uh, up to now, they stopped it. I mean, if you go to a website, probably, you know, you, you, you read that the development is going on, but it's not true because they, they told us till the moment they stopped it. Of course, the performance are not the same as Google Earth. Uh, this, okay, of course, it's, uh, it's a quite new product, uh, but uh, I mean, it works. Let's say, I have to say that our main goal was not to uh, achieve great performance, but to provide an architecture that was working for, for our goal. Uh, hi, I, I came across the open data kit for the last the first time last week and it looked really nice. Um, do, do you know if there's plans to support anything other than Android or do you have any idea how difficult that might be? Um, well, I, I know that it works only for Android. Then uh, probably you know <laughs> something more than me. Uh, you, you no, no, I was just wondering if you knew. No, 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 no. It's, it works just for Android yeah. up to now. Okay. Unfortunately, this is the, let's say, the bad point, but... Uh, Android devices should be more than uh, all the other devices, I mean, from the statistics of last year, so. <laughs> Hi, uh, have you had much participation? Has it been rolled out? Do the users, are they using it successfully? Well, uh, we did not publish this application, uh, but we just um, proposed them to the people with which could be interested. For instance, the, uh, we published the application for reporting the road pavement damages to some administrations, and uh, we uh, started some projects possibly for the future because really l next year we had these terrible problems about uh, all damages in all the streets and the municipalities had, had no money to intervene everywhere. Uh, but actually, all the application you, say, you, you, you saw were uh, restricted to a small group of applications because we wanted to test, first of all, the architecture. Okay, thanks. I still see questions. We have, um, oh, like five minutes, I think. Yeah. Okay. So for uh, clarification, did you say, uh, it sounds like you're running, uh, you're running ODK uh, on local database. This is on the mobile device or or you only did it on the web? No, 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 it's not on the mobile device. Okay, fair okay. enough. No, Thanks. no, 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 the, the, the database is installed on, on a server, of course. Then you just connect, of course, you have with your mobile device, you have to connect to the server just writing the, the URL and just get informed from the server and then send informs to the server. Thanks, I want to see if it works in disconnected environment, just, uh, just curious, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I can show you with my, <laughs> with my smartphone. <laughs> we have one gentleman over here. Never mind. Thanks. Your architecture seems to have Glassfish as well as Tomcat. So haven't you got a bit of an overload of servlet? Well, we, it was just a choice related to to the to, to our exp I mean, to, to the experience also uh, of the students that um, had to work on that part because actually we had, to, we had to participate to that challenge, so we say, okay, we had to start also the, the use of my SQL instead of Postgres. Of course, it's something that could be, could be done. I mean, it could be done, but um, there's no reason actually to use two different databases. So it was just a choice. Okay, thanks. Um, well, probably, is there still questions? Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank the, the, the four speakers. Actually, we had four sessions.